Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. This International Women's Day, I'd like to celebrate the indomitable spirit of a woman who has dared to reach for the stars and played a pivotal role in shaping our understanding of the cosmos. Joining me on the show today, I'm delighted to introduce Malaysia's first astrophysicist, Professor Emeritus Tan Sri Dr. Mazlan Uthman, Senior Fellow at the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. She has served twice as Director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. And in early 2000s, in the early 2000s, she spearheaded the Ankasa One program, which led to the launch of the first Malaysian astronaut, Sri Muzaffar Shukur, to the International Space Station. So, Dr. Mazlan, uh, Professor Mazlan, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. I appreciate you taking time to talk to me. Happy International Women's Day. And Hi, Melissa. Hi. And uh, so today I, I was hoping to start our conversation by maybe asking you to um, reflect a little bit on your journey in the field of astrophysics. I, I'm curious to know what sparked your interest in the space sciences and whether there were any um, you know, significant advancements that had captured your imagination during those formative years? Um, I uh, actually, uh, in the school system that I was in, uh, you know, more than half a century ago, uh, there wasn't any astronomy, not even in books in the library, you know. And so my exposure to astronomy was very late, except that when I was doing English literature, I I found a poem by William Butler Yeats on the cloths of heaven, you know, where it says, had I the heavens embroidered cloths and trying to describe how beautiful the heavens are. And I thought, you know what, this is, this is nice. And that was the first time I think I was attracted to anything at all to do with the, with the sky. And, and then you uh, flash forward, I went to university uh, that was when I discovered astrophysics because I went to university very clearly wanting to do physics. I mean, um, my teachers wanted me to do medicine, but I, I was not you know, interested. And so I went away to do physics. And of course, when I was studying physics, astrophysics was one of the options. And suddenly I saw uh, uh, the then the convergence of everything I was interested in, uh, the poetry, philosophy, art, and of course science, you know, and so astrophysics embodies all of that until today. Okay. Can you explain how does it embody, because I think of it, you know, most people think of physics as purely a, a p pure science field. How does it embody philosophy and literature and the arts as well? I'm very happy to tell you how. <laughs> so, you see, I'm not talking about um, solid state physics or um, nuclear physics. I'm talking about astrophysics. Astrophysics is a, is a study through physics of the universe. And so, um, so if, you look, if you look at any books, any of the book on astronomy and astrophysics, you can't run away from the fact that there's ever in the, in the between the bookends, it's all aesthetics, it's all beautiful pictures of the planets, the nebula, the galaxies. And so there's a lot of aesthetics in, um, in space. Uh, the beauty there has cannot even be imagined by our artists, you know? So, so that, that, that's the art side, the aesthetic side of it. But if you look at today, how we approach astrophysics, it's all philosophical. There's so many questions the physicists cannot answer. Uh, what is time? Uh, what is uh, space? You know, what is dark matter? What is dark energy? There's a lot of philosophical elements there. So uh, art, um, philosophy, and of course religion. Almost every religion has its uh, version of cosmology, which is so exciting, you know. So you, you can um, look at it from any point uh, that you, you are interested in, from chemistry, from geology, from religion. Yeah, and so that's why I love astrophysics. Okay, well, then I'll ask you a philosophical and scientific question. Um, the search for extraterrestrial life, that is... <laughs> 
<laughs> that seems to be one of the reasons why we gaze to the heavens and wonder whether we're alone、um, on Earth. It is this quest. So why is this quest?、Um, Important, not just from a scientific perspective, but what fundamental questions does it seek to answer about the nature of life in the universe? Okay, so I think it's inherent, it's innate in all of us、um, to know who we are. And when you once you start asking who you are, you ask what purpose do I serve? And if you ask about what purpose do I serve, what am I in the bigger context of the world? The universe. Finally, you ask this question, you know, of humanity in the universe, and of course, then you start asking, are there any beings like us? And it goes down to, is there even life anywhere in the universe? And so, the,、uh, it's a, I think it's a natural progression of you、uh, examining who you are. You you get to that point, you know, and so it used to be a giggle. People giggle when you ask when they when you start asking, are there is there life outside there? Because they talk about UFOs,、huh? and UFOs have a lot very high giggle factor. But actually, the study of life in space, which is what we call astrobiology or biology of space, is a very uh, uh, it's a thriving and expanding、uh, scientific. Endeavor. So you've got biologists,、uh, geologists,、um, you know, everybody involved in thinking about life in the universe. How did life begin? So then you ask, if you are going to ask about how did life, how does life begin in the universe, you have to ask first, how did life begin on Earth? So you see, automatically by asking the bigger question, you come back to humanity. How did the humans, especially how did life even begin? Because for us, life is not just about complex life like you and me, but bacteria.、Huh? And、mm. I, you know, if we find bacteria anywhere、uh, outside of Earth, I tell you, the excitement will be huge. Right. So where are so are there promising targets for signs for searching these、um, microbiome signs of life?、Um, and wh- where would where would we look? There now there is there are so many places to look, you know. And as we send telescopes out into space,、uh, the number of、uh, planets we are discovering. That may have environments that are suitable for life is increasing exponentially. You know, there are so many、uh, options now, and I'm sure you've heard of James Webb Telescope. So, with James Webb Telescope, is not able to even see uh, individual uh, planets now. But then, of course,、uh, it'd be very, very hard for us to look for life, even though we can see these individual planets. So the way the scientists do it is they look for si- signatures. We call it signatures. We call it bio signatures because you and I, in <laughs> fact, affect the, the the atmosphere of the Earth. You are not just an innocent bystander here, because we 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 breathe in oxygen, we breathe out、uh, carbon dioxide. So all those processes、uh, have changed the chemistry of the earth tremendously, dramatically. So if we can find、um, on one of the planets, you know, some uh, some um, gases, I mean, elements that don't fit, you know,、uh, what should be there. You can suspect that there might be life, but I'm calling. I'm using the word suspect because we cannot say for certainty there will be life. Yeah. So, so these endeavors to search for、um, signs of of life out there are, are they、um, are they nationalistic pursuits or are they、uh, collaborative?、Um, Work. I, I'm just wondering because you know I think of、um, sp- you know work about space exploration and the like as collaborative and involving partnerships between different different、um, international organizations or countries. But could it be a nationalist pursuit when we think about putting a man on the moon? It's a very Americana thing. You wave the flag, right? Are there benefits of cooperation and collaboration in the field of space science? In fact, the benefits of collaboration is greatest in space because no one country 
right now can afford to do anything at all in space. Um, the, the investment is too huge. Eh? So that's why if you look at the American program to go back to the moon now, because of course they've been to the moon before, is they have uh, they have been looking for partners, partners who will invest in the in the technology developments and also partners who want to do the science once mm -hmm. they are up there on the moon. Similarly with China, China is working with Russia, but of course with the war now, Russia has stepped back a little bit. But China uh, is looking at uh, uh, leading the developing countries into uh, uh, their, their moon base, unlike the US who are very selective about who they, they want to befriend. Eh? China is not so, is, is open, you know. So they've come to Malaysia as well uh, to say what can can we, we can we get involved in the moon program. So a lot of things happening in space right now are collaborative, you know. Okay, so collaborative. That that's interesting. Are there um, laws that govern outer space? Yeah. How do so we think this, about that? <laughs> so this, this is the cool thing, you see, and that's why we cannot be nationalistic because the um, the legal regime that actually um, regulates what we do in space are all international treaties. And why are they international treaties? Because the first thing that we agreed, we, all the nations, agreed in the United Nations is that space, all of outer space, you know, is the common province of all humankind. So nobody can stick, even though the Americans have their flag there, they do not own that spot. They cannot own that spot. Um, okay, so it's not about colonizing um, no, outer space. No, no, okay. No. <laughs> there are very, uh, laws against that. Of course, uh, very clever lawyers, as you know, there are very many of those who can, you know, um, find loopholes. Um, but still, the general mood uh, mm. of uh, the international community is no, that nobody should own any part of uh, space. Okay, so, so tell me about your time serving as director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Um, I, as I understand it, the role deals with almost everything to do with outer space. So everything from um, space debris management and how, you know, the international uh, cooperation, the rules of engagement in outer space. What, what does the role entail specifically? So, uh, at the, so I was at the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. So people are always surprised, what, the UN has that sort of office? Uh, because in 1957, when, when Russia first, I mean, successfully launched Sputnik to space, everybody was worried that it would trigger an arms race in space. And it did, in a sense, it, it, it triggered a race. Uh, but we were, I mean, the UN was quite determined not to make it an arms race. And so that's why you have various treaties, uh, agreements and conventions, um, that make sure that there is no arms race in space. So there's the Outer Space Treaty, which is the Magna Carta of space, you know, which was um, came to force in 1967. Uh, that uh, treaty actually uh, prevents, that is one, the first time you say this is the space is a common, uh, is the common province of all humankind. That is uh, in, in, that, in that treaty. The outer space city. But then there's the other, you, you talk about um, space debris. Yeah? So yeah. space debris, why is it so important? It's because it will hit other satellites or it will come down through your roof, hit your car, something like that. So, so what is um, uh, important then is liability. So if there's space debris and it makes my satellite dysfunctional, who am I, who shall I sue? In terms of liability, so there's the liability convention, you know. So and, and uh, astronauts, who are they? We want astronauts to be um, em emissaries of humankind. So if you if you meet an astronaut, he falls down in your uh, country, you <laughs> must return the astronaut to his home because he is the human, you know, he's the emissary of humankind. Well, so you can put him in jail, for instance. Right. So. Uh 
I thought you were rumored to be the emissary for our humankind. I, there were reports I remember reading. I was rumored to be the UN ambassador for aliens. Right. <laughs> So, so if and when um, we have extraterrestrial life come to Earth and they say, take me to your leader, you were supposed to be that person. Okay, but this makes sense, you know. You, people may laugh, but I say, and even I laugh. But, you know, uh, the, when, when the Brits uh, were asked by, uh, I can't remember who, uh, if there was such a question, who, who, uh, who would be the leader? And of course, this person said, and he's, you know, he's working a lot with me and, and, and uh, space treaties. He says, the director of the UN office for outer space affairs. Who? And then he mentioned my name. Okay. But why? Why? Because uh, if you, if um, an alien ship lands, lands on Padang Merbo, I'm saying Padang Merbo because it's just down the corner from me. Yeah? So if it lands on Padang Merbo, for instance, what do I do? What? I mean, so do I uh, get Anwar Ibrahim as our prime minister to speak on behalf of humanity? I don't think so. You see, so the 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 uh, principle here is that there has to, there has to be a spokesman or woman who um, represents all of humanity, and that person is the secretary Gen secretary general of the United Nations, right? He is the leader of the United Nations. Okay, mm -hmm. now we can agree to that. Uh, nobody must represent humanity except the Secretary General. Now, the Secretary General, he's in New York, you know, so he's going to say, oh no, I mean, how do I verify this? I mean, is there really somebody? What do I do? You know who he's going to call uh, to verify? The Director of the Office <laughs> of the Space Affairs. You see? So, Go and see the director of the Office for Outer Space Affairs and she will. <laughs> I, I have to say, of all the people that I've ever interviewed, that has to be the coolest title. And but you an ambassador to aliens would be and the coolest title for aliens. For aliens, amazing, amazing. I, I want to um, move to the time where you uh, came back to Malaysia or you were kind of quote unquote, called back to Malaysia um, to help spearhead the Angkasawan program. And I, I went to go back to that time and think it was a very proud moment for Malaysians um, when we had succeededly launched our own astronaut into uh, space. But I do want to ask you, what do you think to be uh, were some of the broader benefits or achievements of that program beyond putting a Malaysian in the space station? Sure. Uh, first of all, the public should know that uh, when I came back, it was to set up the National Space Agency. Uh, uh, when I came home in, 20, in 2002, I had no inkling whatsoever, Melissa, that I was going to set up the astronaut uh, Angkasawan program. But what triggered it? Now, you know, uh, I, I went, uh, after I came home, uh, you know, I, I uh, devised the program, you know, the national program for 10 years, 15 years, uh, I mean, you know, that... Um, and of course, I was talking about satellites and possibly rockets, benefit for humankind. And you know, every time I say this, eh, the press, the media would just look at me and look at me and I can tell it's going above like that. <laughs> okay, but then eh, they will always ask me the question, okay, so now we've got a NASA-like agency, when are we going to send a Malaysian to space? The first time I had this question, I was a bit taken aback. I said, oh, oh, yeah. I mean, like, so I said, no, no, no. We're setting up the agency not for human, not to send humans to Malaysians to space. But then I repeat, you know, it's, uh, the uh, uh, benefits for agriculture, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Then an another time, another occasion, the press, uh, my interaction with the press was the same thing, you know. They would ask me again. And not only that, then the, the public started asking me, uh, <laughs> and then so I suddenly realized, Melissa, that it's nothing wrong with them. It's something wrong with me. Why am I not getting it? Because then I realized that you can put as many satellites as you can, as you want to. People relate to people. And if they want to have a, a closer understanding, especially an interest in space, 
I have to look it from the human dimension. So I went to see the Prime Minister at that time and said, you know, uh, I'm, I, this is a program, this is going to be a lovely program and all that, is, you know, for security, blah, blah, blah. Then I said, but you know, I have a little question, I said to him. I have been beleaguered by the press and the public. They all want a Malaysian in space. How do we react to this? And he said, you know, uh, Oka has quite this vision, you know, how to bring Malaysia to becoming space faring nation and all that. Then he said to me, in, in the history of the uh, country, and especially in uh, where we are now, he says, we have to have something inspiring that brings people together, that brings the races together, that brings the youth, uh, you know, uh, people of different economic strata together to be proud in the one thing. And maybe astronaut program is, is the thing. And so, yeah, then he asked me, okay, if, if we, do you think we are ready? Yeah, yeah. So he asked me the next question. Do you think we are ready? And I, you know, with that batting and eyelid, I said, yes. <laughs> Regardless of whether we were or not, you said yes. But I, I knew, I knew we were ready, yeah, Melissa. I knew. I because the question was asked of me like um, 10 years earlier. And I said, no. So, yeah. In 2002, right. when I was asked this question, I said, yes. Excellent. When that is I, I remember, though, there were um, there was some criticism at that time, or there were some skeptics at that time who said that investing in in this endeavor was a luxury that Malaysia could ill afford because there was you know so many socioeconomic um, issues at home that we needed to resolve. How did you explain? Uh, how did you respond to those skeptics? Okay, there are two aspects that we are looking at. Now, one is the uh, Angkasawan program aspect, and one is of course our satellite uh, program. Now, with the satellite program, you know, um, the, 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 the benefits are so obvious, you know, Commun communications, you know, how you, you cannot use your handphone now. You cannot use your GPS you know, if there is no space asset. So I think that the, the uh, justification is made over and over again every day, you know, whether it's agriculture, defense, uh, maritime, you know, security and all that, the, the uh, justification is made. But what about the Antasavan program? Why would we uh, even try to indulge in that? So when the first time, when uh, after I was asked, are we ready? The next question was, how much is it going to cost? <laughs> okay, and then I said the number. I said, if you went to the marketplace, this is how much you're going to cost. But I said, we're not going to go to the marketplace. We're going to find a different way of funding this astronaut program. One would be co-funding with the public, you know? So one-to-one, -one, uh, um, the government gives a certain amount and uh, the public, so it's co-funding, you see. And the other one is to see if we can get into cooperation with some of the space-faring nations. Okay, so I had, then I went away, I said to him, I look at all these options. And then, uh, Melissa, this is what I mean by the planets are aligned or were aligned. Two days later, a letter came across my table saying that uh, there is a possibility of buying the Russian Sukhoi 30, the latest of the Sukhois. And they are asking for uh, proposals for an offset program. Meaning that what offset means is that for the amount of contract that you give to this um, well contractor, a certain percentage must go to public good. That's what it is for. And so I said, okay, then there are two things I said uh, I would like to propose. One is for the, for the Russians to launch our satellite. Two is for the Russians to launch our astronaut. <laughs> there we go. And, you know, once, uh, once the Ministry of Defense, once the Russians got hold of this, it was a no brainer. They wanted the astronaut program. The Russians wanted the astronaut program so bad because they know that once they have that program, it would explode, you know, interest and everything. And the mileage that they would get out of that will surpass anything that they do. And well, so well, they insisted on it. Yeah. Well, you know, um, so that was 2007, right? So that was the launch. 
the launch. But I started negotiating with the Russians in 2003. 2003, okay. So I think about how much time has passed. So, you know, two decades have passed since, and yeah, yeah, and and the the nature of the space industry of uh, space exploration has changed. There's increasing privatization of space exploration. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Is this a good thing, or is it, you know, a billionaires' boys' game of ego? Yes. <laughs> Privatization is good. All is good to me because privatization uh, increases competition. You know, even in, in the US, uh, uh, whatever they privatize, they, they give to SpaceX, they also give it to Boeing so that they will compete, you know, to get the best, the fastest, the, uh, the, uh, the cheapest or whatever. So competition is always good. So um, the other thing that I want to emphasize is that there is no country in the world right now that uh, whose space program is purely commercial or is purely privatized. You think that the Americans, you know, well, they are um, the, the, the industry is so huge, so clever, so innovative that the government doesn't have to invest anymore. Cannot be more wrong than that. Their, in, their budget for space is increasing every year for defense as well as for the civilian program. NASA, NASA spends about 20 billion a year and the defense is maybe 10 times that. <laughs> just, they just don't know, you know? And so um, there's no way that uh, if you want to have a good space program, the government can say lepas tangan, you know, uh, go away. Mm -hmm. No, you look at India, you look at China, you look at Japan, who else you want to name? The Euro Europeans the uh, government investment in space is huge. Eh? Uh, maybe mm -hmm. now the, the private sector investment is uh, getting bigger, but particularly in the field of communications, satellite communications, because that's where the money is. Eh? But mm -hmm. we talk about space exploration, to go to the moon, to go to Jupiter, to go to Mars. Uh, NASA is also planning to go to Mars. Eh? They're not leaving it up to Elon Musk alone, although I'd love to go with Elon Musk. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, I think if one thing that this conversation has said to me is that you really, you know, you can't tell what will happen. It's such a, a wide open space of possibility out there. I want to thank you so much for uh, speaking to me, Prof, Prof Mazlan. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Melissa. That's all we have for you on this episode. And happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much for watching and good night.